Aquilo. Season 4. Chapter 12. The Hearts of the Problem. You have to be careful what you wish for. While Annabelle took it in stride when we first met under the magical beauty of the Donsolites, there has been, since that day, a thirst in her. Who can blame her, though? This is genuine magic we're talking about. Being laissez-faire about some dancing lights in the forest is one thing, but being part of the ritual to summon these lights? Seeing me practice my own craft and having helped me page through my family's recipe book? Those are experiences that bring the mysteries of Aquilo far closer than a mere parlor trick. Every time I spoke about appeasing the ghost of Gary Remington, or the tales of my fighting an honest-to-goodness hunger demon put a feverish glint in her eyes, like that of King Midas hearing talk of gold. When Olivia and I explained our theory about the Aquilo raccoons, she was like a child hanging on every word of a favorite bedtime story. For someone so enamored by science, Annabelle has a voracious hunger for all things magic, including the strange sort of low kitchen magic the Dufour women practice. Even the sad tale of Agnes and Peter, my dear lust demons from two summers ago, only fueled her curiosity further. There's no doubt to anyone who sat and watched as she heard our stories that Annabelle would have killed to be there with us at the time. Okay, poor choice of words, but the sentiment remains— Annabelle has longed to be part of one of our little supernatural investigations for a while. Now, under the beating rain of a southern Quebec afternoon, she's getting her wish fulfilled. But I don't think she's finding it quite to her liking. As it turns out, old man Hans was exactly as rich as I was told, perhaps more. Even from the side entrance of his four-door garage, it's clear that this is more than just a place to warehouse cars. It's a veritable museum. There are, of course, a handful of luxury cars. Three, to be exact. A British racing green Jaguar, as evidenced by the pouncing chrome hood ornament. It looks just old enough to be from a time when owning that particular brand of car was the height of luxury. Then there's a sportier little number, a convertible white BMW. The roof is down, allowing us a perfect view of the lush tan leather interior. This is a much more recent vehicle, and one that has seen more use. Further down is another, even older car. The model escapes me, but it's a second convertible. Bright red and with the black top still on, it's so clean and polished that it might as well be a showroom model. The symbol, a red cross and green snake surrounded by a blue circle, doesn't ring a bell, but it looks fancy and European. The last two vehicles are the ones that are, by far, the most interesting. What they lack in sophistication, they more than make up with how storied they appear. What the hell is that? Stefan wonders aloud. And I agree with him. What the hell is that? The car in question sits at the back of the garage, between two workbenches. It's surrounded by a velvet rope to keep people from touching it though I struggle to decide who would even want to. Obviously, it's not meant to be driven, not in that condition. It's far less of a car than it is a husk. The windows are soot-stained and the paint is chipped and flaked off most of its surface. It must have been a sedan because it has four doors, but the make and brand are impossible to make out. The tires are melted onto the hubcap and the interior is nothing more than a charred mess reminiscent of a used fireplace. That's Helmut Hans's car, Annabelle murmurs, a sudden reverence in her voice. The one he owned before the fire. What a morbid souvenir, I think, to keep the car from the fire that killed his family. He must really love cars, I whisper, not sure what else to say. Yet, of all the artifacts we find in this little automotive display, this isn't the one that holds our attention most, nor is it the one that attracted Annabelle first. There's another vehicle, aligned with the middle door of the garage. It's the only one that's filthy, and the only one to have seen any recent use. 
Bulky and white, it's one of those big Ford pickup trucks. Old and weathered, I have to assume this is the ride Helmut Hans used most, the better to blend in with the average citizen. And to keep the rest of his collection in perfect museum condition. The paint is caked with mud near the wheel wells, and there are minute scratches here and there on the doors. There's even an unsightly crack on the windshield, something a man like Helmut could easily afford to fix. Curious enough, however, is a particular stain near the tailgate, right above the lights. Vaguely hand-shaped and a little too red to be mud, it draws the eye like candy attracts children. And on the floor behind the truck, leading all the way to the side door to the garage, is a slick trail of days-old blood. Annabelle guessed right. Someone died here, or at least was mortally wounded. We shouldn't touch anything, Stefan says, a tremor in his voice that is easy to empathize with. Even Annabelle, who alerted us to this discovery, hasn't moved since taking her first two steps into the garage. I'm the one who turned on the powerful fluorescent lights in the ceiling. I'm the one who's tiptoeing towards the suspicious handprint. Mother. I'm the experienced one here. I'm the goddamn adult in the room. What a terrifying notion. We're not touching things, I explain, taking a few more steps around the BMW. But as long as we're here, might as well take a look. Hesitant nods are slow to manifest from both of them, but they thankfully animate their bodies and start following my lead. Both are careful with where they put their feet. Annabelle out of pure fear and worry, and Stefan because he's Stefan. Each of us takes a slightly different path to the back of the white pickup truck. I walk near the front of the garage, almost rubbing against the automatic mechanical doors, afraid with every step that one will jitter and crank to life, opening to the elements. Annabelle starts off by tracing my steps, but changes her mind midway through the journey. The patches of dried blood covering large portions of the cement floor aren't too hard to navigate, but they demand a strong stomach that she's yet to develop. What does it say about me that I no longer worry about such things? Lastly, Stefan picks a much more interesting path. He goes all the way to the back of the garage, making a point to walk next to the burnt-out car, allowing his eyes to linger on the details of the vehicle. I can't tell if there's a point to his curiosity, or if it's purely academic, but he goes about his inspection with typical Stefan levels of attention. Arriving at the back of the truck, we finally get a proper look at the interior of the trunk. The tailgate is still open, and there is an uncomfortable amount of blood pooled in a corner. More troubling still are the pieces of flesh that pepper the floor of the bed, like forgotten detritus from a previous cargo. Miriam, don't. It's Annabelle who demands that I stand my ground and stay my hand, but I can't help it. Doing my best not to touch any of the blood, an impossible goal if there ever was one, I climb into the trunk of the pickup. My shoes, already wet from the torrential rain, slip on the coagulated blood. Why does it say that? Stefan mumbles, the words a blubbery mess like the sound of a low-boiling pot but I'm barely listening at this point. I crouch next to what looks like a pile of discarded roast, a chunk of bloody meat the size of my thumb, coated in dried blood and other fluids. It's a side effect of being a cook, and a lasting symptom of having worked in a butcher shop that I can tell my meats and organs apart. This looks like muscle, but more fibrous, and with very little fat to it. Next to it is another anatomical leftover with which I'm familiar. In fact, anyone who's enjoyed pub food would recognize it. A chunk of rib, about an inch long. And that's what litters the floor of the bed. Muscle and rib. The missing pieces of Nancy Tripoli. Miriam, Annabelle repeats herself. Please. Here we are. In the middle of an investigation, much like the first one I endured when I initially set foot in Aquilo, chasing down clues and trying to understand what evil, supernatural or not, we are facing. Her skin, which is normally pale to match her blonde hair, looks almost translucent under the fluorescent lights. 
Not only has the blood drained from her features, but Annabelle's face is now covered with a glistening sheen of sweat. Stefan isn't faring much better, his body language telling of a desire to flee the scene as soon as possible. As much as he detested his night speaking with Detective Lamour, I can tell he'd do anything to have the grizzled veteran here with us. But I have one last thing to check out. All around me are markings, staining the white paint on the interior of the bed and the back window of the cab. I know what I'm going to find when I touch these markings, but I have to make sure, no matter the horror implied. I pull my finger across one of the brown stains, stretching it as it spreads under my touch. I rub index and thumb together, confirming the obvious. More blood. I take a look at the marking I've disturbed, my finger having erased half of a letter P. Scanning the truck, I try to count the number of times the same thing is written, but I give up after the first dozen. Everywhere is the same thing, the same words. Too poor. Despite the cracks spreading over the surface of his calm, Stefan manages to remain his stoic self. The shimmering anxiety he'd shown at the door of his apartment was intensifying, his muscles more taut and his feet showing more signs of wanting to take the rest of his body away. More concerning, though, is Annabelle's reaction. Hey. I drop out of the truck's bed, wrapping an arm around her shoulder. Maybe we should go? The poor girl is in a half-crouch, supporting herself with hands on her knees, both legs shaking like they have a fever and her breathing short, showing signs of inevitable retching. I'm fine, she lies. It's just a lot. It is, I confirm. We have to get out of here. The list of reasons why it makes sense to leave is too long to simply pick one. Whoever did the killing could still be here, and who knows what they might be capable of. Especially if, as Annabelle suspects, it's a demon. Stefan is still a person of interest to the police regarding the death of Nancy Tripoli, and we've already danced all over this crime scene. Maybe Lamore will buy that we got curious, and maybe he won't go too hard on us, but not if we keep playing junior detective on his turf. I've contaminated the scene enough, and I'm afraid that was a bad example to set. And then there's the obvious, simple horror of what's on display before us. It isn't just a lot. It's too much. Why too poor? Stefan murmurs, having overcome the initial shock. Damn his analytical mind. We can ask these questions later, I say. Come on, let's go. Mr. Hans anything but too poor. Not you too, Annabelle. It's not about Helmut Hans. This is about Nancy, but why? No, no, no. I wag my finger like some angry mother figure. We are not doing this. So what? Annabelle asks. Mr. Hans hires Nancy for whatever, then finds out she's effectively homeless and kills her? He writes too poor with her blood in the bed of his truck before driving her body back to your place? That's insane. I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm just asking why an old man would kill someone like Nancy. Maybe she tried stealing from him? At these last words from Annabelle, something in Stefan seemed to snap. It wasn't anger. The tension in his muscles remained, but it no more ebbed or flowed from where it had been prior. It was something else, far more subtle yet impossible to miss. A minute twitch of his eyes, followed by a profound sadness upon his features, were all the signs needed to see that things had changed. She wouldn't do that, he said, composed but a veritable powder keg. She lived with me for weeks and never took anything, never even asked to borrow a dollar. Annabelle could see the switch that had been flipped, too. I'd seen her nervous and excited in the past. Even when confronted with supernatural forces, she was not one to back down or shy away. But seeing that wave of quiet outrage flow through Stefan was enough to make her step back. I'm not saying she did, but all it takes is for Helmut to have thought otherwise. That seems enough to mollify him, a little, but this was not a wound that could be opened and closed at will. The flesh, once ripped, 
would take time to knit itself together again. While no longer angry, his sense of righteous indignation made him volatile. I can deal with vanilla volatility. I've seen it before often enough in customer service. Angry people getting angrier faster. Insults are served up with abandon, and the underlying threat of violence fills the air like the smell of a banquet. It makes for a dangerous but easy meal to navigate. With someone like Stefan, though, I'm dealing with a much more exotic type of volatile. He's a rare pink sea salt and butterscotch volatile. The old saying goes that it's always the quiet ones, and while I try not to baste everyone with the same sauce, sometimes these sayings have meat to their bones. I don't know what Stefan might look like when he explodes. I don't know that he's capable of it. I also don't think this is the time or place to find out. I swear, I'm about a second from opening my mouth ready to firmly voice my opinion on the subject, maybe even put my foot down as the authority in the group and get everyone out before things escalate. But when do I ever get what I want? All right, then. Stefan walks over to the door leading from the garage to the house. Only one way to figure this out. And then, without thinking, he puts his hand, fingerprints and all, on the doorknob and twists and pulls. A moment later, he's stepping in, putting his wet boot print all over the floor on the other side. If I needed any proof that my unemotional friend was falling victim to his feelings, that was it. Stefan was a veritable forensic thunderstorm, leaving every possible proof of his passing in his wake. Stop, I call out, hoping that somehow I can unspill this flower. If this was our everyday Stefan, he'd have frozen in his step his natural compliance to authority freezing every muscle in place. But this is pink sea salt and butterscotch volatile Stefan, and he simply plows on without a second thought. Mother damn it, I grit my teeth. Annabelle, stay here. I storm off after Stefan, trying not to touch anything more in the process. My feet hesitate before crossing the threshold held back by my keen awareness that I'm about to put my own trace all over Helmut's home, not just his garage. No sooner have I entered Hans's house than Annabelle follows, hot on my heels. Because why would anyone listen to a damn thing I say at this point? Helmut Hans's house is almost exactly what I would have expected a rich, old, lonely man's place to look like. Nothing here hasn't been touched by the hand of a professional interior designer. Sure, there are personal details here and there, and every trinket, frame, painting, and piece of furniture is carefully selected to express the personality of the owner. That's the key, though. The whole decor is precisely curated. This is a portrait of Helmut, painted with an expert hand. It shows none of the creases and pockmarks left behind by real life. Where choices aren't quite as calculated, a few things slip through. An old armchair that doesn't fit the theme of a room, or an irreplaceable picture with colors that don't marry well with the palette used on a particular wall. These remnants and debris of a man's life often tell far more about them. Like the pickup truck and burnt-out car say more than the Jaguar and the BMW ever could. The room I stand in is a sort of antechamber. It serves as a buffer zone between the garage and the main house. Hooks on the wall are covered with jackets and sports caps, offering Helmut a selection of outfits to best suit his needs. Wooden boxes under the hooks house boots and shoes, again in a wide variety. And behind the door are the keys and key fobs one for each vehicle in the garage, even the burnt-out sedan. That last one isn't hung on the wall, but set inside a wooden frame. Another sad souvenir of a happier life. Wow, Annabelle whispers. That guy just couldn't let go. I nod, struggling not to let the devastating melancholy infect me. There will be plenty of time to be crushed by the tragic horror that has been Helmut Hans's life up to this point, especially if we get the luxury of theorizing how it might have led him to snap and turn homicidal. 
though I don't think that will be a conversation Stefan should be a part of. Speaking of the devil, he didn't stick around to inspect every piece of depression memorabilia in the room before moving on. Following him into the house proper, he's again nowhere to be found, though the wet boot prints on the floor make tracking him easy. Again, Annabelle and I are floored by the abundant luxury of the place, but also, it's another curated room with only one piece out of place. This seems to be a sort of large reading room, or small living room, all depending on how one prefers to interpret it. A set of two luxurious burgundy leather armchairs dominate one wall, facing an antique armoire repurposed into a television stand. The walls are covered in framed photos of Helmut, a gallery of his years with his cars and his horses. Each image is proportioned and positioned in a way to best fill the wall and tell the story of a man's life and passions. Except for one. Of all the images, it's the one with the youngest version of Helmut, but also the only one with other people. Instead of the professionally shot image, taking perfect advantage of sunlight and framing, this is an amateur photo. A little off-center, with colors slightly washed out and grainy, a family of four stands on stone steps leading to a large oak door. The frame is cheap and, upon closer inspection, singed on the edges. This is yet another souvenir saved from Helmut's tragic past. My fingers move toward the frame, forgetting my own appalled warnings about leaving fingerprints and incriminating evidence. I want to touch this memory, as if it can give me a firmer understanding of Hans. I'm so close to brushing the flaking burnt varnish, the skin of my index an atom from contact, when Stefan's voice cuts through the otherwise oppressive silence. Jesus! I run, of course, sodden shoes slipping on the varnished hardwood floor, nearly sending me sprawling to the ground. Annabelle catches me at the very last second, helping me stay upright and pulling me along as we round the corner to the next room. By the looks of it, this is the kitchen. But evidence would otherwise suggest a slaughterhouse. Stefan, perhaps shocked back into his better senses, stands on the threshold, hands pulled close to his body, afraid to touch anything and disturb the scene. He has found Helmut Hans. Okay, Annabelle breaks the silence first. Now can we get out of here? All I can do is shake my head. This is like a horror movie. Not only because the ceramic floor is slick with half-coagulated blood, but in the structure of it. The way a good horror movie is built, at least in my opinion as someone who doesn't enjoy horror at all, it's all about keeping everything exciting and interesting. Mysteries and revelations compete with screen time as the heroes slash victims make their way through the story. The more we learn, the higher the stakes. It glues butts on seats and keeps us in the theater even though we know for a fact what's coming. Then, the rug is pulled out from under our feet. A little at first, then a little more. And then, the whole thing is removed, tossing us to the ground. Horror is a trap. And so is this situation. We came here for answers, and they were fed to us a little at a time. Every step we had the option to leave and avoid the pitfall. We could have gone home at the first tug on the rug when we saw the blood in the pickup. We should have run at the second tug, when Stefan went in the house. But no. We stayed until the slasher jumped out of the woods or the monster burst from the shadows. It's too late now. We can't leave. If this were a movie we were watching, the worst we'd be risking would be the label of coward. This is reality, however. With... Every piece of evidence we've left behind, with everything we've seen, if we leave now, without reporting all of it to the authorities, we'll be suspects for sure. If we go, Lamore will have our heads, I say. Even if we didn't do anything, leaving a crime scene, we'll be lucky if he doesn't nail us to the wall. Come on, Detective Lamore is a sweetie, Annabelle counters. He wouldn't do that to us, would he? I shrug, 
pulling out my phone. Maybe, maybe not. He's nice to us because we don't mess with his investigations. But Lamore is a professional. He's been at this case longer than I've been in Aquilo. I don't want to get between him and his work. Annabelle seems to understand, but her eyes grow wide and her head cocks to one side as my thumb navigates my phone's menu until I find the Aquilo Police Department, Canadian side, phone number. You're calling him right now? Might as well get it over with, I explain, finger hovering over the call button. No, 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 Annabelle cautions, gently pulling my hand up and away from the kill switch. Fine. We have to call Lamore. It's the right thing to do. I get that. It's not great, but I get it. But we're here. This whole scene is super weird. We might as well find out as much as we can before we call, right? I hate this idea, but what did I expect? The more we look around, the more we put our fingerprints, hair samples, and boot prints all over this place. We've already created a forensic nightmare— I'm the one who got us started. But Annabelle punctuates her suggestion with a wink and a side glance at Stefan. I get it. The chance of this being a series of normal murders, if there is such a thing, is slim at best. Whether it's a demon, fairies, or freaking warlocks, it doesn't matter. This is going to be outside of Lamore's field of expertise. But the moment the detective gets here... Any clue I could use will be out of reach. Speaking of Stefan, though, he hasn't moved since discovering the body of Helmut Hans. He hasn't spoken up in our conversation or voiced an opinion either way. Part of me wants to think that he's completely crashed, his operating system unable to cope with the conflicting instructions of obeying protocol and the law while also learning more about the death of his friends. The stakes are terribly high for Stefan. Lamore wants to pin these murders on someone, and my barista is a convenient suspect. When the good detective finds out Stefan is at a scene with another body, I don't think he'll let go of that one after just a few questions. Fifteen minutes, I say. Not a second more. And be careful. Touch nothing. Annabelle nods, and I have to admire how well she recovered from the scene in the garage, or acts like she didn't even notice the dead man on the floor. To her further credit, as she passes the threshold out of the kitchen, she carefully removes her boots. I'm not sure it'll do much good, but I can appreciate the effort. This, of course, leaves me with the biggest problem on deck. Stefan. Just like Nancy, he mumbles as I step up next to him. He must have been listening, but decided his attention was better invested in looking over the body. He's right. This is like Nancy. Poor old Helmut Hans is lying on the ground, a hole punched out of his chest and his heart missing. Slivers of bone and fat color his wound ivory and yellow. Except... There are a few key differences. His heart isn't completely absent. I can see chunks of it on the floor and stuck to the side of the counter. And where there was little blood around Nancy's body, Helmut is literally bathing in his. Yeah, I agree, unwilling to go into detail. So whoever killed Nancy also killed Helmut. And for some reason, you're the one who discovers both bodies. The speed at which he turns on me, towering above my head and with a fire in his eyes I did not think could burn there. I could believe he's about to hurt me. It's so sudden that I swallow a yelp of fear and clench my fists, ready to defend myself. You think I killed them? His outrage is pure, untainted by hurt. His ego, for whatever it is, remains unharmed by the fear of accusation. He's all rage and fury, which is a terrifying sight. I've always felt safe next to Stefan. He's an inoffensive, almost forgettable presence. Except now, where, for the first time, I can feel the threat of him. No, I force the word out. But someone brought Nancy's body to your place, and I bet they wanted you to find Helmut's here. 
I don't want to say you're being framed, and maybe this is a coincidence, but I gotta ask, do you have any enemies? He looks surprised at the suggestion, and, well, yeah, I'm surprised by it, too. I have no idea who would even consider Stefan their nemesis. He's got nothing worth stealing. He's so typical, he might as well be a caricature. Being mad at Stefan would be like being mad at wallpaper or rice pudding. You can dislike the guy, maybe, but who has the energy to pour anger into that? He shakes his head, confirming what I already know to be true. All right, I say, struggling for a new theory. Maybe you're just a convenient target. Did you notice anyone or anything strange in the last few weeks? Aquilo, he shrugs, and of course, he's right. We both turn to look at poor Helmut, a few feet from us on the ground. It's odd, but I take comfort in his facial expression. This is a man who lived in a veritable museum of his own tragedy. The contrast of his wealth and privilege against the horrors of his past always present, no matter what room you visit. At least now, he looks relieved, free from the memory of his loss. They say that money doesn't buy happiness. Others say that it makes misery more comfortable. Helmut Hans had built a perfect life of comfortable misery for himself, and now he was finally free of it. Jesus! Annabelle's scream came from across the house. God damn it! Her swearing was followed by a few thumping noises, and finally the sound of a body sliding on a wall and onto the floor. Annabelle! I cry out, terrified of what I'll hear, or won't hear. My feet take off before I can do anything to stop them, before I can give it a second thought. I race through the house, tracking water and blood with my boots wherever I go, desperate to guess where Annabelle's scream came from. We never checked if we were alone before she went exploring. I only briefly considered that the killer might still be here, or even take in residence in the house. What if it's a serial killer, or another demon, or a demon serial killer? This is Aquilo. The possibilities are nearly endless. I hear Annabelle swear again, but this time I recognize pain in her whining. It's the same kind of pain I had when I cut my finger with the knife. It's the pain of a wounded body, but more to the point, a wounded ego. When I find her, it's in a little study at the back of the house. The room is tiny compared to everything else we've seen so far, and it's made smaller by having walls painted a dark emerald green. A small mahogany desk takes up most of the space, cluttered with books, papers, and an ancient-looking laptop computer. The screen on the laptop is on, glowing a weak light and calling to me with promises of Helmut's secrets, but it's Annabelle that demands my attention first. She's lying on the floor, underneath an empty frame. Her hands clutch her foot, red with fresh blood as she attempts to stem the flow. All around her, shards of a broken mirror litter the floor, with one piece in particular lodged in her heel. Ouch. I suck in a breath between my teeth. It looks kinda bad. I know, she says. I'm sorry. I know you were worried about leaving forensic evidence, and here I go bleeding over everything. Yeah, I say, kneeling in front of her and helping her take off her sock. I think that ship has sailed. What happened? You break the mirror? She shakes her head, taking her sock from me to hold over her bleeding wound. It was already broken when I got here. In fact, all the mirrors in this place are broken. I hadn't noticed. In my wild dash to find my friend, I didn't pay attention to the details around me. Why would the mirrors be broken? Helmut Hans didn't shy away from reminders of his tragedy— in fact, he seemed to crave them, surrounding himself with morbid souvenirs. Who would want to erase their own reflection, though? All right, I think it's time to call Lamore. I fish out my phone, but again, Annabelle stops me. Wait, she says, grabbing at the edge of the desk and pulling herself up on her good foot. Before you do that, I found something. Something you have to see. For yourself. Without a care for the bloody prints she leaves all over the desk and on the laptop, she pulls the computer closer and angles it so I can see the screen. A single email window dominates. 
I recognize a bank's logo at the top. It's not from the same bank I use. This seems like a far fancier institution, but I know a confirmation email when I see one. This one is for a wire transfer, the amount of which is nothing short of obscene. If I were told this was the sum total of Helmut Hans's active capital, I would believe it. Before his death, Helmut transferred this astronomical sum of money, which is bizarre and incriminating already, but the name of the recipient is somehow even more puzzling. Victoria Andreas Paramore. Vicky. Aquilo is written by J.F. Dubow and narrated and produced by me, Amy Frost. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to hear more, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your preferred podcast platform. Want to support the show? Buy us a coffee. Go to ko-fi.com slash Aquilo to donate. Aquilo has a Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash Aquilo for details. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under the username Aquilo.